B.J. Hill has officially signed his contract with the Cincinnati Bengals, and, well, they didn't get a comp pick for 2022, but free agency still has a lot of work left to be done, and we'll talk about it today. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. Too cool for school with his sunglasses. We're the Locked On Bengals podcast, your team every day on the Locked On Podcast Network, free and available everywhere you get your podcast. If it's on an audio platform, hit that follow button, or if you're a YouTube watcher, hit that subscribe button, hit the bell if you like what we're doing so we're delivered to your eyes and ears every day. And we are every day. We did three episodes yesterday, and we'll be back whenever the Bengals make their next move. But it was relatively quiet on Tuesday for the Bengals on the second day of the so-called tampering period. The biggest item I would say to talk about today, James, is that B.J. Hill officially signed his contract. The Bengals had a press conference with B.J. Hill, with Zach Taylor. We still don't have the terms of the deal, but the contract has been signed. Yeah, it's good news. And it's good news for a few reasons. And the first one, obviously, BJ Hill is a Cincinnati Bengal for the foreseeable future. The other part of this was I was actually there in person and got to cover that news conference in person without COVID restrictions and protocols. And well, it means a lot to the podcast because, well, we get to bring you video and or audio, depending on where you're watching or listening, uh, of BJ Hill in his excitement following his three-year reported $30 million contract with the Bengals. So I knew I wanted to be back here because I knew it was it's, it's special here. Um, special coaches, special uh, players, uh, special D-line. And um, I definitely wanted to be back. I was telling people, hey, I'm, I'm going back to Cincinnati. I want to be back here. And that was my goal. That was my uh, main priority is to be back here. What was the, the feeling like when you found out that the deal was, was done? And what was your first reaction? Um, this right here, I couldn't stop, couldn't stop smiling, man. And, uh, yeah, it was, I just had this big smile on my face, just walking around the house. It was like screaming, let's go the whole, pretty much the whole day. It was just, it was incredible, man. Um, you worked so hard to get to, to the NFL and, uh, make it to, you know, to your second contract. And, and I did it. Um, so it's truly a blessing to be here. And, and be somewhere that's special. Use the word special a lot, James, describing getting to his second contract, the players, the coaches, the place. And I think that will be very endearing to all of the BJ Hill fans in the world. And, and you're right. It, it's good news for this team that a, a guy like BJ Hill, who came over in the Billy, tri- Billy Price trade, wanted to be back in Cincinnati. And he, he got paid. So good for mm-hmm. BJ Hill securing that bag, as they say, 15 million in year one cash for BJ Hill. So that's a lot of money. It might be, and so far it is the most year one cash the Bengals have handed out to any free agent. And he's going to be a big role player, starter, I should say, play a big role on this team as a starter for, for the foreseeable future. So pretty cool to see him describe the team that way. And hopefully that's the vibe that continues this year because it really did seem like a special locker room, a special place, a special interpersonal connection between these players and these coaches last year. It did. And that's the thing is BJ Hill multiple times. I just took one clip there, but multiple times talked about how he wanted to be back in Cincinnati, how there could have been offers for a little bit more, but he wanted to be back in Cincinnati. And who knows if the offers were more, but I think it was certainly a priority for him to, to come back to the Bengals. And, you know, he, he uh, also said, and I will dive into what else the Bengals could do, but how excited he was that they added offensive line help. And uh, obviously that isn't official. And so Zach Taylor didn't comment and couldn't comment on it. And so if we asked him, he would have been like, well, I'm not saying anything. But uh, BJ Hill excited to have some new team teammates in the trenches, guys like Alex Kappa, that he'll be going up against in practice. Yeah, a little bit more of a challenge for Mr. Hill in practice <laughs> next year. It'll be interesting, right? We we talked about it. We've talked about it the last two OTAs. Like, is the defensive line really good or is this just another year for this offensive line? 
And maybe we're not going to be asking that question the same way with some proven guys on the roster this year. And you're right, James, there's plenty of work left to do. We'll give a little bit of a recap of what the current cap situation is based on our best estimates. We don't have the full BJ Hill contract details, like I said, but before we get there, the other piece of news, well, really really there's two. We'll hold one of them because it's free agency related for a minute from now or so, but the Bengals do not get a compensatory pick for John Ross or or for Carl Lawson, I should say, because John Ross did not qualify as a compensatory free agent. His salary was a little too low and he didn't play enough in New York. So with those two factors combined, the Bengals had an equal number of compensatory free agents gained as compensatory free agents lost and fell out of the running for the fourth round pick they could have gotten for Carl Lawson works out to be something like 39 comp picks, I think in total, including all the new ones that are given out for coaches and GMs and 15 teams got all of those picks. So a little bit of imbalance there for the teams that really managed to the comp picks last year. And the Bengals, unfortunately do not get one of those picks this year. That being said, they may not be in the running for a comp pick again in 2023. And that would be the case if they sign more free agents in the coming days. And I expect them to do just that. We'll talk about what's left for the Bengals to do in free agency in just a minute. But first, I got to tell you about the number one protein bar on the planet. The protein bar that my guy John Ross needs to get, that you need to get, that Jake Lisko has, that I have that a lot of you already have in its built bar. The number one protein bar on the planet. The protein bar that tastes like a candy bar because it's covered in 100% chocolate and they have a ton of different flavors. And I didn't even tell you the best part because it isn't the great taste or the chocolate or the fact that they're just protein packed. It's high in protein, low in sugar, low in calories. It's the macros. They're going to fit your diet and they're going to, well, help you however you want, whether it's a midday healthy snack that you're looking for, whether it's a post-workout protein punch. So check them out right now at built.com. Use promo code LOCK15. You're going to get 15% off your order. Again, get the number one protein bar on the planet at built.com with promo code LOCK15. James, another shocking move for me today in the minor moves category before we get into the Bengals cap situation and what they could be doing for the rest of the week reported by Doug Kide from pro football focus that the Bengals will not be tendering Stanley Morgan. And I thought that between their two restricted free agents, Stanley Morgan and, and Fred Johnson, the opposite would happen. And I was like 90% certain of that. And instead, you know, like I said yesterday, I thought there was no way they were tendering Fred Johnson. He gets a right of first refusal tender. And I thought for sure they would want Stanley Morgan back the way they talked about him and with his special teams role and instead no tender for Stanley Morgan and credit to, to John Sheeran. Shout out John for this because he was on it a couple days ago. He, he DM me like, you think they're going to actually tender Morgan? Like I could see a world where they don't, they, they think they can get him back for less than the right of first refusal tender, which is a $2.4 million deal. And that might be the plan here. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, because I, I think they like Stanley and they would want to keep him. And, and maybe they're looking at it as, well, we have Mike Thomas out there. We have Stanley Morgan out there. Maybe we can get both for close to that 2.4, which, you know, maybe, right? There's a chance of that. And, and so I, I understand it. And there is a little bit of risk involved. I also think the Bengals, they're going to draft a receiver, maybe two. And so... Uh, you know, you're, you're kind of waiting to see there and, and waiting to see how the, the market plays out. Because we haven't really talked about free agent receivers because I just I don't think they're there yet. Maybe, you know, but it, more likely than not to me, they're going to address it in the draft. And so if you keep guys like Mike Thomas, you keep guys like Stanley Morgan, you're going to try to to minimize the hit they come with. And so that's probably why they did that with Morgan, who I'm trying to think, obviously, it was a special teams role mostly. Wasn't really, I guess, as a blocker on offense, but didn't have. Did he have any catches? I'm trying to think off the top of my head if I recall any. Uh, might have in that Cleveland game. I'll look it up. But yeah, it's uh, it's not like he's a huge part of the offense. So it's everything else that that comes with Stanley Morgan that you're you're paying for. Yeah, he he played a lot. He had a carry. He had two catches for 11 yards this there year. You go. 
There you go. He, he had one carry for three yards. Most of his snaps came on special teams, obviously. Joe Burrow talked about his value to the team, talked about his popularity in the locker room at some point. Being a good teammate as Joe Burrow is, he's going to say kind things ab- about a, a key special team or a guy that I'm sure works very hard. And honestly, even going back to the draft was a guy that I think we had like a fourth round grade on as a wide receiver coming out of West Virginia. And ends up being undrafted instead. But both of those guys, as you mentioned, James, are are free agents, Mike Thomas and Stanley Morgan. So if Mike Thomas is looking at getting a similar deal to what he played on last year, which is a veteran minimum, would would Stanley Morgan really can com- command that much more? And, and that's mm-hmm. where you come in at a number potentially below the and, $2.4 million restricted tender. And by the way, Morgan went to Nebraska. I know you know oh. that, but I'm just clarifying. Not West Virginia. Who am I thinking about from West Virginia? I, no, I, I thought that he was one of two guys from West Virginia that I'm just confusing him with somebody else. Anyway, I, I, I'm just full of little mistakes like that. The wrong agent earlier this week, Peter Schaefer, and and it's all right. Hey, Stanley Morgan. That's, that's why we're, there, there's a lot of names. There's a lot of discussion that's gone on. So that that's what happens. But. Um, a next thing guys. next, do, do you want to get to your cap? You want to get to the cap stuff? You want to dive into what I think they should do, what you think they should do? Because now they have holes, man, right? They yeah. Tight so end hole. They've they got some weaknesses. Let's talk about where they are from a cap perspective, because I think that instructs what they're going to do next. My calculations currently have them, and this is with a rough guess or, or an educated guess, I should say, for BJ Hill's contract. We're currently projecting that around $8 million for a year one cap hit, and that could go up or down probably 500,000 to a million. And the other note here, James, is that the Bengals are now in the 51, the top 51 rule of offseason cap accounting, which means any additional signings that the Bengals make will push off out of the top 51 about $700,000 for the next five guys the Bengals sign. So say the Bengals give Stanley Morgan a $1 million contract, that pushes $700,000 off of the top 51 rule the new cap hit for Stanley Morgan in the off season is now $300,000 because all those guys beyond 51, you only carry 53 to the regular season. That's why they have that top 51 rule in the off season. Yeah. And, and that that's part of why the draft, uh, you know, everyone looks at the draft numbers and stuff. What is it? It's like two and a half million, three million in cap space that they're actually going to use on their draft picks, assuming you know, that, you know, nothing, they don't trade up to the fifth pick, which they're not going to do or anything yeah. like that. So, but they're not going to use a lot of cap money on the draft picks. It, it'll be about two and a half million dollars of cap space in year one for their draft picks this year. That number might actually go down a small amount in case that was including the, the fourth round comp pick. I don't think the rookie pool allocation that I've been using did include that comp pick, but yeah, two two and a half ish million dollars of cap space for rookies and about seven million in cash. Because even the cash offsets happen. When you bring in rookies, guys down roster will get cut for those rookies and, and then they don't end up getting those big payouts that they would if if their contract started tolling in weeks of the regular season. So I have the Bengals at in, in raw cap space, assuming a Trey Hendrickson not Trey Hendrickson, Trey Waynes and Trey Hopkins, the other two trades, assuming those two guys are released. I have the Bengals at 29.7 ish million dollars in raw cap space, around 30 million in cap space. And after accounting for the two and a half million for rookies and the five to 6 million or so that the Bengals like to roll over, that number is closer to 21 million in cap space. So to, to put that in terms of contracts, the Bengals have signed so far, that means they could afford another set of something like BJ Hill, Ted Karras, and Alex Kappa's contracts. That comes in around twenty million dollars, or five Ted Karras con- four sorry four Ted Karras contracts comes in around twenty million dollars in that year one cap hit, or some combination there with some smaller deals as well because they do save some money in cap space on that top fifty one rule going forward. So still plenty of space to do some work. They can make some big moves. And and I think they will. I don't think they're done. I think they're still looking for, as you said, James, they have some holes, tight end, right tackle, cornerback too. And I think they're probably going to be looking for starters and free agency at those positions. Yeah, I certainly hope so. And you, you talked about my 
my outfit earlier for those watching on YouTube, for those not. You know, I got a little chain on, got a little, little sunglasses on today. Yeah, I'm indoors wearing sunglasses. And basically, if you want Joe Burrow to show up the news conferences, post-game news conferences next year, like this, all swagged out, but on a Joe Burrow level where it's, you know, real chains and real sunglasses that are worth more than my car, and, you know, things like that. If you want him to, to be all swagged out, well, they got to win games, but you want to keep him clean. And I know we're talking a lot about Lyle Collins, Jake, and I'm not saying I don't want him, of course, but there's a lot of ifs and why is he still out there and why is no one traded for him and what's going on behind the scenes and character stuff. And who knows, maybe Lyle Collins is a Bengal by Friday, right? Where he gets released Wednesday and they work out a deal and all that. And I'm okay with that. But have you seen the past couple of days who's been released? Because we've talked about two, one of the guys on, on this podcast, Daryl Williams. We talked about him last year a ton, 35 inch arms, uh, 29 years old. So he's on the right side of 30. I would be fine with that at right tackle. He's got guard experience if you need him there, if there's injuries throughout the year. And here's the guy that I want to run by you that I know a lot of our listeners are talking about on Tuesday after it happened. A guy I covered in Cleveland for a little bit. And I didn't realize how good he was last year because he is 31 now which I hate that I'm like the age, I'm 30, but I'm about to be 31. I'm the age of these guys that we're calling old, the worst, and I'm still not used to it. J.C. Treader is going to hit the market. He's the president of the NFL Players Association. He played at a really high level for the Browns for five seasons, started 80 of 81 games. The only game he didn't start was because of COVID-19. He was on the COVID-19 reserve list after uh, contracting the coronavirus. I looked at him on PFF, made a ton of sense, had his best PFF score uh, of his career this past season, 78.7. I don't know, man. I, I know they have Ted Karras, and I know they signed him to be a center, but Karras can also play left guard. If you're telling me from left to right, there's a possibility of Jonah Williams, Ted Karras, J.C. Treader, Alex Kappa, and then you got Daryl Williams. You got Williams squared on, in the trenches on, at tackle. I'm, you said 21 million, whatever. I want to keep Joe Burrow upright and looking clean so he can look clean after the game as well. And you can do that by adding those two guys. I mean, I think they would have the best offense in the NFL. And I'm saying that with the straight fit. If they, if they got those guys, how would you stop this Bengals offense? It would get a lot harder to rush the passer. And, and that's the goal, right? Daryl Williams was not as good last year as he was two years ago when I coveted him before the bills brought him back. But I think part of that, and I think I said this yesterday was because exactly. they're moving him around. He's moving from right guard to right tackle all season long. He was better at right tackle than he was at right guard. So be careful when you're using those PFF numbers, but I, yeah, I think JC Treader is a good player, man. And I don't think that the Bengals are necessarily going to be in. I know. So fr from a, a pragmatic Sorry for the bucket of water on your head point of view. I'm skeptical, but I, I could see it. I just think that the way the Bengals probably see this is, yes, we're probably going to go acquire a right tackle to start, who's better than Isaiah Prince, certainly better than Isaiah Prince uh, last year. But are we going to go acquire four new starters in free agency on the offensive line? Think back to what the Chiefs did. And, and the Chiefs went out, and, and obviously they traded for Orlando Brown. They draft Creed Humphrey. They draft trades, Trey Smith. They, they paid big money uh, for, for uh, Joe Tooney. Mm -hmm. And their other tackle was already on the team, I believe. So, so they got new guys, but they only paid big money for one, right? Am I forgetting somebody? Am I forgetting a transaction? Well, Orlando Brown, I mean, you're right, because Orlando Brown, they franchise tagged him this year. Right. right? So they had to, that part of it. Um, so, they signed a couple of other guys, but none of them were big money, right? They brought in uh, Kyle Long out of retirement, Austin Blythe, right. they, they signed right. at some point. Yeah, that's right. So so, so the, the point is, I guess, there is that it wouldn't be the same as what the Chiefs did because the Chiefs found starters in the draft. They, they got... They nailed the draft on their offensive line. Joe Tooney was great. Orlando Brown was a fit. And so going through free agency it would be a different approach, but it would be entirely remaking your offensive line similar to how the Chiefs did. I do wonder about the scheme fit a little bit there 
with some of these guys, not necessarily the most athletic, although JC Treader obviously comes from an outside zone scheme, would have no worries there. Uh, I think our guy Bengal Sands has talked about Ted Karras' ability to function in a wide zone system for sure. Mm-hmm. I, I do wonder about the, the perfect fit, but if you can get better, I'm less worried about the perfect fit and frankly, less worried about the run game if they need to do more gap stuff because that's what their personnel calls for i'm also fine with that if they need to go to more of a power game i don't think that's the end of the world because they're not thriving on the easy stuff off of wide zone either so uh, sign me up i i would love that plan james i just don't know if it's realistic so maybe we should talk instead about who do you think the realistic targets are for the bengals and the rest of this free agency period yeah, I, it should be realistic. Well, so I know, I, it, it, and so that's that. That's the part that because I agree with you. What they want, they want Jackson Carmen to emerge as the left guard. And so what you're doing is, is, is if you pay Treader, a 31 year old who they haven't, it's always been sub 30. Then one, you're admitting you're risking paying a, an old guy for what he's already done versus what he will do, even though he's coming off of his best year at least by PFF metrics. And then two, you're saying that, eh, Jackson, Carmen, we're going to leave you on the bench at least for another year. And that's the part of it that that I think they would hate to do. But is Ted Karras better than Jackson, Carmen, in, you know, in 2022? I mean, probably. And so that's the part that's tough, you know, especially alongside J.C. Treader. But I agree with you. Realistic? Well, Brandon Scherf wasn't realistic for a reason, and they just spent on guard. And so basically, if if they go after a guy like Treader, it means that they're spending three years, 18 million on, on a guard in Ted Karras. And, and I just, is that okay money? Sure. But for the Bengals, they're like, oh, well, we have the second round pick and we have other guys that we could potentially draft to compete at that left guard spot. So I think they're going to prioritize right tackle, obviously cornerback. And there's still, as we were recording this on Tuesday evening, there's a lot of corners. I, I think that they'll prioritize that over a guy like Treader. Yeah, that's kind of what I see at this point. If it is a guy to to compete at guard, I think it's a guy on the Ode Abushi level. The the near, you know, less than three million, less than four million range. But I mm-hmm. I, I guess I wouldn't be shocked if they went and, and got Treader. I just would put it like below twenty five percent. That's that's probably because, where that is because I think they're going to pay a guard starting or sorry a right tackle starting money, and they're going to pay a corner starting money like Cheeto level starting money and hope they get it right again, and they're going to pay a tight end probably six seven eight million a year too, and those don't necessarily equate to huge cap hits, but that's probably the majority of their spending on starting level players for the rest of free agency. Let's talk about tight end because we didn't really get to a, a ton. We we had the uh, CJ Uzama news at the end of Monday night's show with uh, when we were on with Malik Wright. We had him on, and uh, so look, CJ Uzama's gone. Three years, twenty four million to the Jets. Good luck, CJ, because that's a, a tough situation. Even though they do seem to have improved their roster some in free agency, who stands out to you? Let's just cross off Gronk. I assume he's going go to have to the Bucks. I don't want to. Yeah, and me, me neither. I've been on like the Gronk like train. I I think I built a Gronk train, which didn't even exist. He has his own cruise ship, right? That he does the Gronk cruises. Yeah. I built a train in 2022, and, and I, I was gonna you know have it loop around Paul Brown Stadium. Unfortunately, uh, it doesn't seem like Gronk is coming to the Queen City. Yeah, the names that I that I highlighted, just looking at our tier list, right? Gerald Everett, OJ Howard are the two that that stand out the most to me from an athleticism perspective and, mm-hmm. and don't necessarily come with the injury concerns like guys like Bob Tanyan and Max Williams. And then I know Joe Goodberry has a whole Tyler Conklin hive going to mm-hmm. Conklin, who Minnesota traded for last year. I know there's some folks out there that are interested in Hayden Hurst, and I believe Kyle Rudolph is available. And with his Cincinnati roots, Bengals fans always ask about Kyle Rudolph. Most of those guys don't move the needle for me all that much. So I'm really looking at Gerald Everett and OJ Howard and OJ Howard is particularly interesting to me because of his pedigree, because of his athleticism, because of his draft profile. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be my, my priority one. If I had to pick a guy, I, I think he would be the most fun. 
and and that would be followed by Gerald Everett, most likely as a guy that Zach Taylor's familiar with and brings a little bit of speed athleticism to the position because really what they got from Uzama was like average, average plus blocking. He was a pretty good blocker. Not, not quite a Drew Samples level, but he's a pretty good blocker. And he was a he was an explosive play threat at tight end. It wasn't consistent, although he mm-hmm. was a good check down option. He he found those sneaky yards after catch on third down that we talked about during the year. But he also broke off some big plays for them in the playoffs against Jacksonville and made some clutch explosive plays for them. So whoever they bring in, I'm looking for a guy that has some speed to him. Have some speed, be able to catch. And and those are really the the top two priorities for me for whoever they bring in at tight end. If you can block a little bit, great, because they used uh, Uzama as a flex piece. But what do you think? Is there somebody else that I'm missing, or somebody you like more? No, not really. I, I would probably have OJ Howard at or near the top of the list. I can confidently say if Marvin Lewis were still within the organization, OJ Howard would OJ Howard would probably already be a Cincinnati Bengal. He loved him in the 2017 draft, and you know Howard was. Really not a big factor for the Bucks last year coming off of that Achilles. He's 27. I like that. I like taking a chance on upside. And maybe, you know, for a cap reasons, you do a two-year deal and it, you try to lower that cap number this year and do it that way because, oh, you have O.J. Howard for 27 and 28. Like that's, you know, you know his age, 27, 28 seasons. I believe that's what it would be. Even if it's 28 and 29 and his birthday's coming up, you still take it. He's drafted in 2017, so he would probably be the top for me because I know he's a, a pretty decent blocker. I know he can do all the other things and is athletic enough to be steady at tight end and, and be a threat, you know, in the red zone and uh, as a tight end because Joe Burrow likes throwing to tight ends. But I understand where Joe Goodberry is coming from with Tyler Conklin, um, I, and I was surprised when I looked up his athletic testing because <laughs> it was not, uh, it wasn't pretty. Um, from what I saw, uh, Gerald Everett obviously is a really good athlete, the familiarity with, uh, with Zach Taylor. So to me, if I had to rank them, obviously it's Gronk, go get Gronk. If he's available, like go get him right now. He's, he's probably going back to Tampa Bay. So again, um, wishful thinking there, if I had to rank him, I'd go and I'll just do a top five OJ Howard, probably Tyler Conklin, Gerald Everett. And it's really close there. And then after that, I'm going upside before I go like Kyle Rudolph. I think Rudolph is going to be there for a while. He's on another tier than a lot of these guys. Maybe you go after Tanya or, or Tanya from, uh, from the Packers. I mean, he had 11 touchdowns a couple of years ago, right? 2020. I know he's coming off the ACL. He's yeah. supposed to be, I did a little research. He's supposed to be healthy uh, in time for the start of the regular season. Maybe you can steal him, you know, and, and he's a guy that, you know, could be a, a red zone threat. So that would be four. And after that, just pick a name out of a hat. Maybe it's Hurst, the former first rounder. Yeah. Maybe it's Max Williams. You know, it's but but they need a guy. They can't roll yep. with Drew Sample and Thaddeus Moss in drafting a guy. And that's what a lot of people have tweeted me. And I'm like, that's not good enough. You got to get someone just to bring up the floor of that room. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100 percent there, James. And we'll we'll see who it is. It, it, Hayden Hurst isn't a bad name to throw out there with the pedigree. Mm-hmm. He, he's a decent athlete as well. Could be seen yeah. as a reliable guy. Um, I, I feel like it's going to be tough to, to the tight end market being what it is. These guys all getting seven, eight, nine million dollars to be average, average plus tight ends in the NFL. And so they're, they're going to need to probably make a move there. But, you know, to me, more interesting is corner, more interesting is right tackle. I know Joe Burrow likes throwing to tight ends, James, and it would help in the red zone if they could get a guy that could be a red zone threat. But this offense doesn't seem to have a huge need for a great tight end. It does often seem like it's not a feature of this offense. It's more of a a complimentary piece or sometimes an afterthought. But right tackle, hugely important. There's not one on the roster right now. And it is to me a, a massive need. And, and I think that, mm-hmm. you know, they, they don't have corners under contract. Mm-hmm. So when we look at the guys there, you, you see in guys like uh, Levi Wallace went to Pittsburgh today for $4 million a year. DJ Reed went to the Jets for $11 million a year. 
So the, the market a little bit in flux, I'd say. Some guys getting more than expected, like DJ Reed. Some guys getting less, like Levi Wallace. And, and that could be a product of the organizations they're going to as well. Chavarius Ward last night getting $14 million a year, but still some good corners out there. Yeah. Whether it's, you know, veterans like Stefan Gilmore, Casey Hayward, or some of the younger guys, Steven Nelson, who you had in your free agent plan, Darius Williams, who I had in my free agent plan from the Rams. One of these guys... Or, or going down the list to a guy like Akello Witherspoon, Dante Jackson, who Malik mentioned last night as a favorite for him. Uh, Eli Apple, who still may be back with the Bengals. Still still a lot of guys out there, but you want to go a tier above Kyle Eli Fuller. Apple if Kyle you're looking Fuller. for a starter. What about Kyle, Kyle Fuller? You like him? I think I, No, I wouldn't be shocked if they're interested. I went back and listened to what Malik said and tried to decipher oh, yeah. it in in, in, in what guy do they think has a little bit left that is is kind of being questioned and, and out? Well, Kyle Fuller a couple of years ago, no one was questioning his game. Uh, is he, he, is, oh, he is on our list. He, he's he is 30. 4.1 4. on our tier list. How about right tackle, James? I mean, we talked a lot about Daryl Williams. I'm still really hoping for Lyle Collins. Yeah, I mean, and I know fans are dreaming of, as I was describing my situation, you know, scenario, it's probably Collins that they're thinking of at right tackle and not one of these other guys. Look, I still think if Trent Brown, the longer he's out there, that his price has got to come down at some point. And the Patriots, they have offensive line issues. Who knows? Maybe they'll just bring him back. Um, I would say this too, and I'm not saying this for the Bengals, but Teron Armstead's still there. Yeah, what's going on? And, and so is it just the injury? You know, he's just coming back and they want to make sure, but it's, it, it is weird. It's unique. And so uh, if he's out there, it, it kind of limits who else is going to sign. I mean, we haven't seen a ton of movement, so that that's good in, in a way for the Bengals. Cause there's a lot of these guys, Morgan Moses is still out there as we record this, yeah. a lot of guys that could uh, fill that right tackle spot. The, the tackle market really hasn't moved at all. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. And and one theory I like for Taron Armstead, and maybe maybe the world is just waiting for Taron Armstead and, and Lyle Collins and all these things to happen. Trent Brown. The the theory I like for Taron Armstead is the Saints are trying to figure out if Deshaun Watson's coming. And yeah. if Deshaun Watson's coming, if they need to figure out a way to get Taron Armstead back or if those are hinging on each other a little bit for New Orleans. Hard to say. That's very speculative. Uh, last thing to mention i think real quick here james unless you have anything else for the bengals is a well, move that well, real quick just because i don't want to bring up watson five minutes from now again or two minutes or whatever i hope he doesn't end up in cleveland yep <laughs> that sucks mitch trubisky's one thing baker mayfield's something fine but the last thing you want is a guy like that ending up in cleveland with a division rival go ahead yeah i would not like that very much Either The last thing that I had to mention was Marcus Williams signing with the Baltimore Ravens on a $14 million per year deal from New Orleans was one of two remaining unanimous tier one guys on our tier list. James, him and uh, the aforementioned Taron Armstead were the two guys left and he's a good safety man. I think he makes the team better for Baltimore pairing him with uh, 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 another Marcus in the secondary and Marcus Peters and uh, 44 Marlon Humphrey makes a good secondary. It should be a fun matchup with the Bengals wide receivers, but more interestingly to me, and we'll talk about the matchup whenever we get to Ravens week later is the $14 million per year figure. This is one of the guys that was seen as a top of market safety and the secondary prices this year in general, JC Jackson, Marcus Williams are not, I think what Jesse Bates is hoping for. And so mm -hmm. perhaps this provides a framework for Jesse Bates deal a little bit more guaranteed here than the Bengals are probably comfortable giving out. But I think it's in the ballpark and hopefully may, maybe not hopefully, but perhaps there are some guidelines here for the Bengals to get that deal over the finish line. And the only one left is Tyron Matthew, right? Can he, and, and I don't think he's going to set reset the safety market or get close to, to Adams. No. I, I wonder where he ends up. And so you're right. I mean, this is, it's been a, a productive free agency from a safety standpoint for the Bengals because yeah, they got their guy and Jesse Bates, do you, do you want the long-term deal or not? And look, the guaranteed money, there's no doubt the way the Bengals, you know, structure things and how much guaranteed money they give it. It was a factor last summer. I know what, with these Bates negotiate negotiations, and I'm sure it is now. Um, 
do you just want to take that, you know, that 12 plus and potentially risk getting tagged again next year? Cause the number is not going to be crazy high. And, and then what, you know, that, that, then who knows where the market is, maybe the safety market's booming then. Um, but there's a lot of risk involved in that as well. So I think, uh, I think Bates has a lot to think about and his agent, uh, certainly has a lot to think about here after what we've seen in the safety market in the secondary as a whole, like you mentioned. And to go back to corner, I do think that's why the Bengals, not that active on Tuesday, a lot of the NFL not, wouldn't be shocked at all if they steal one of these mid-tier guys. There's Because there's a lot of them out there. And yeah. so if you have them all in like a similar range, one of them is going to go for less. They're not all getting the same contract. Some may go higher, some may go lower. And the Bengals might be able to find some value there at tight end at a couple of these spots weirdly quiet on Tuesday. I think there will still be some really big contracts that come down, but it'll be interesting to see how things play out the rest of the way. The Bengals for once to me feeling more salary cap strap than cash strapped will be interesting to see how that plays out because my projections have them at another 21 million expected in, in cap spending, but, but like 50 million in cash spending and trying to get those two married up is a little bit challenging. They'd have to be deals like BJ Hill where they're doing 15 million in year one cash and 8 million in year one cap. So we'll see how that all pans out as well. The Bengals will still be active this week though. Expecting cuts probably this week still for Trey Waynes and Trey Hopkins. And we'll see who the cap cuts are around the rest of the NFL today as those moves continue to happen. But when news breaks, we'll be back. We'll have you covered with emergency podcasts, breaking news podcasts, whatever it is. If the Bengals move, so do we. And that's why you listen to the Lockdown Bengals podcast. And we appreciate it. Until next time, Bengals fans, who day and have a good one.